So just as a, a bit of an outline and just to expand upon what um, Natalie had mentioned. So we do want to do, we'll, we have a, a couple of minutes just to do a participant overview. So to get a sense of where you're from and who you are and kind of what questions you may have for us. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about uh, health promoting schools and some of the work that's been, that we've been doing. Um, specific to substance use and where there are opportunities to intersect with the education system. Um, Novella is going to talk about some of the background, uh, so some of those questions that uh, we get pretty routinely in terms of what does substance use among youth look like um, and what are the current trends and where are, where are things going. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 and where there may be some opportunities for intersection uh, and support from health promoting schools and the education system and what our staffing looks like on the ground uh, with school health promoters, strategic partnership and engagement consultants uh, across the province and, and what that looks like like. Um, and then we'll throw it open for some discussions. So I kind of look forward to hearing what you have to say and, and what questions you may have. We were curious about who would be um, interested and who would be engaged. So it's nice to see there's representation from across grades. Uh, of course, there's a focus with um, uh, senior grades and, and 9 through 12. Um, so that's great. And also great to see uh, people outside of healthy living um, uh, so that we can think about, I, I'm always curious about how do we um, engage in substance use discussions and education across uh, uh, grade levels and also across um, uh, uh, specializations in terms of what people teach, whether that's math or English or theater or you know all, any of those things. So health promoting schools is a, um, program that's been operating uh, funded from uh, public health since about 2006. Six, it goes by a, a variety of different names. So kind of recognizing that health promoting schools have across the province. So you may know it as healthy school communities in parts of Western Zone. In Eastern Zone, uh, it has the name of Blossom. Uh, and health promoting schools in central and northern zone. So it, this speaks to the regional development of health promoting schools initiatives uh, regionally, but it's also confusing because we don't necessarily have one uh, consistent name. And that's one of the things that we're working on. Um, the core principle around uh, health promoting schools is to change the context within school communities in order to make students default decisions healthy decisions. So trying to apply health promotion principles to school communities to change the environments within schools. So comprehensive school health uh, or health promoting schools is a nationally recognized initiative. Uh, it's funded across the country. And in fact, it exists in a number of different countries. Um, and what it tries to do is to incorporate health and education into the lives of, of students. So if you want to uh, jump to the next slide, Novella. I have a big, massive quote, but I'm just going to read it along, along so you get a sense about um, what we're trying to do with health promoting schools. And this comes from Gary Roberts' uh, document in 2009, Faster Alone, Farther Together. Uh, so these are directions around uh, Nova Scotia's health education curriculum. So his sense in terms of a health promoting schools approach integrates curriculum, healthy school environment, health services, and parent and community involvement in a coordinated fashion for the benefit of students and staffs. Um, Furthermore, in a dynamic and vibrant health promoting school, participation, empowerment, equity, democratic processes are emphasized. Students and staff take active, active responsibility for their own health and that of the school environment. In so doing, uh, they are practicing citizenship in their schools community and contributing directly to the core mission of schools. So it's quite an exciting program. and. Uh, exciting that we have uh, resources that we're able to provide for health promoting schools. So it's not, we're not just saying these are good things to do, but we are able to back that up um, with funding opportunities as well. And what does those funding lo opportunities look like? Oh, you can give me the next slide. <laughs> I don't know if I can control the slides. I'm afraid to touch anything. Um, and these are some slides that were adopted by Western Zone, the Healthy School Communities team down there. But just to give you a sense, so the the, the graphic uh, in the corner uh, shows the four different uh, pillars of 
health promoting schools. So there's healthy school policy, there are community partnerships and services, there's teaching and learning opportunities and physical and social environments. Um, and then there are the four aspects or the, the primary areas that we fund are physical activity, healthy relationships, healthy practices and healthy school food environments. Um, so certainly the breakfast program would be a bulk of our funding uh, and looking at um, delivering food throughout the day to students who are uh, both in need and in terms of helping with their their learning right so we know that a well-fed student uh, is a healthy learner as well um, but we also provide funding for uh, these other for those four aspects as well and one last slide i think yeah one last slide and this is very complicated so i apologize for it but it gives you a sense about how um, the complexity or the number of different uh, services and service provision and where they kind of fit. So a number of you may be uh, very well um, engaged with Schools Plus, for example, uh, and they kind of, this pyramid um, is a health impact pyramid. So uh, it may be a bit, uh, there may be a bit of confusion for you if you think about it from the multi-tiered system of support or the MTSS and their three peers. So there's a similarity in terms of the upper parts of the pyramid are really looking at individual uh, interventions, uh, clinical interventions and long-term, long-lasting protective interventions. What health promoting schools tries to do is to really look at the bottom two tiers of the pyramid. So changing the, the context of schools to make individuals default decisions healthy. And then some of the socioeconomic factors that we look at are determinants of health, such as poverty, literacy, uh, sexuality, um, and how, uh, how we can start to shape those at the very bottom level. So health promoting schools is in green, but you can see that there are um, other interventions. So Schools Plus works a little bit higher up the pyramid, adolescent outreach workers uh, that uh, operate through mental health and addictions, for example, uh, they tend to do, they do some health promotion work. They also do some, um, I wouldn't say clinical interventions because that kind of moves it up the pyramid, but they do more individual um, interactions with youth in terms of supporting their uh, decisions around substance use, for example. So just to give you an idea about how, uh, where Health Promoting Schools tries to fit itself in the, the context of working with schools and working with youth and working with educators. So I'll let Novella talk a little bit more in terms of what we see uh, when it comes to substance youth that, substance use and mental health in Nova Scotia. Great, so um, I don't wanna throw a lot of data at you, but I did wanna start you off with a bit of a picture of what um, substance use and mental health looks like among youth in Nova Scotia. And so um, of course, mental health and substance use are linked and um, positive mental health is a protective factor for substance misuse. And um, you might remember that Nova Scotia used to have um, the um, provincial survey, the Nova Scotia Student Drug Use Survey. It ran from 1991 to 2012, um, so it it ended, and so now the province um, relies mostly on federal uh, data to look at substance use um, in the province. And so you'll see that most of this data comes from CSTATS, the Canadian Student Tobacco, Alcohol and Drug Survey. Um, and so while it's a federal level survey, it does produce um, provincial level um, results. And so you'll see here uh, in 2018 to 2019, 25% of Nova Scotia youth, so that's grades seven to 12, reported vaping in the last 30 days. Um, 4.5% of grades 7 to 12 reported, reported being current smokers in the past um, 30 days. So current smokers is defined as uh, daily smoking or occasional smoking. Um, as far as um, alcohol use in 2018-2019, 41% reported alcohol use in the past 12 months. And then of these youth, uh, almost 25% of grades seven to 12 reported alcohol use um, in the past 12 months. That was defined as high risk drinking. And so high risk drinking is defined as five or more drinks on one occasion. Um, and then for um, cannabis use, 
use. Um, 29% reported cannabis use in the past 12 months. And now this um, number was significantly higher than the national average at 18%. And from the Canadian Community Health Survey um, for um, among youth uh, 12 to 17 years, um, almost 75% reported their mental health as very good or excellent. And this was sort of in line with the national average of um, 76%. Now there's a range of factors that can influence or determine um, substance use and misuse. And so um, risk factors can increase a person's chances for substance misuse, while protective factors can reduce the risk. And so you'll see here um, uh, sort of a, a table of uh, a number of different factors, risk and protective factors at um, multiple levels of influence. And so um, I won't go through um, um, each and every one of them. And, and this table is definitely not comprehensive. It kind of more gives you a few examples of each level of influence, but um, just to give you some of examples and, and all of these factors um, can interact um, as well to determine if and to what extent um, um, a young person engages in substance use and whether that use is experimental and uh, to what extent that use becomes problematic. And then of course, uh, over and be above this, um, there's public policy. And so um, all of these different factors can be impacted by municipal, provincial, and federal policy. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And so when we talk about prevention efforts, um, we're looking to focus not only on addressing these risk factors, but also on promoting these um, protective factors and resiliency as well. And so you'll see a little bit, um, you see a figure here. It's This is sort of the approach for how we think about mental health and mental health, mental illness. And so men mental illnesses are conditions where our thinking, mood and behaviors severely and negatively impact how we function in our lives. And mental health, um, on the other hand, is a positive concept. So it relates to our ability to manage life in ways that help us cope with stresses and reach our goals. And it's important to our overall health. So um, we can think of mental health as, as much more than just the absence of um, mental illness. And so what this um, visual shows, it's a, it's a two continua model, and it just shows how um, mental il illness and mental health can um, intersect and coexist. And so, um, for example, people with mental illness can experience good mental health, and then conversely, um, someone with, without a mental illness can also experience poor mental health. And so just like um, what we saw with substance misuse, there's a number of factors that can either put us at risk for um, or protect us from mental illness and poor mental health. And so um, again, when we're, when we're talking about prevention efforts, um, we're thinking about going beyond just focusing on those risk factors um, to um, include those protective factors like coping, um, resiliency, and connectedness. And Novell, I think there's a connect, a strong connect with the previous slide or those two slides in terms of risk and protective factors, and then that model, uh, the two continuum approach as well. So individuals who have um, greater opportunities to have protective factors in their life, um, they may, uh, if they are experiencing mental health difficulties, their uh, ability to flourish with that is much stronger. So, you know, you can see how this kind of layers one over the other. Great. I did want to give you a little bit of, of an overview in terms of um, the pandemic. And so, um, it's long been known that epidemics and pandemics can impact mental health. And we know that there's a relationship between substance use and mental health. And so um, um, in terms of pandemics, typically the research shows that alongside those feelings of uh, you know, isolation, anxiety, depression, and those disruptions to normal life, um, people can turn to negative coping mechanisms like the use of cannabis, alcohol, and tobacco. And so more, specific, um, more specifically to COVID-19, there's been um, 
a lot of new research lately on the pandemic showing that it's um, it has had and continues to have a long lasting impact on population mental health and substance use. Um, and so this impact is going to be um, different for children and youth because they experienced the pandemic um, and continue to experience the pandemic during um, a really important developmental period in their life. And so um, just, just really quickly um, to talk about some of those main concerns that, uh, for children and youth, they relate to um, family stress, a loss, um, a disruption to their normal um, routines and schedules, uh, loss of social connection and loss of um, outdoor and play and recreation opportunities, especially when we were at the height of um, safety measures around the pandemic. So those are kind of all the, the main concerns and issues as it relate to children and youth, um, and which all can lead to stress, depression, anxiety, irritability, and reduced social support in this group. And I just wanted to quickly touch on um, the Statistics Canada survey here. You might have seen that Statistics Canada ran a series of um, COVID-19 surveys. You might have even participated in one. Um, and so one of these surveys was um, uh, focused specifically on mental health. And the survey found that um, out of all age groups that were surveyed, it was youth, so ages 15 to 24, that were most likely to report a negative impact on their mental health since physical distancing measures were put in place. And so 41% um, of this age group reported symptoms consistent with moderate or severe anxiety. So where are there opportunities for support when we're talking about health promoting schools? So I kind of turn back to the four pillars approach when it comes to comprehensive school health or health promoting schools um, and looking at things like school policies, teaching curriculum, social and physical environments, partnerships and services. Um, so when we're looking at the bottom uh, aspects of that uh, health impact pyramid, you know, school policies, we, we are strong advocates for the development of strong reviewed substance use and mental health policies that are implemented consistently across schools in Nova Scotia. Policies should focus on prevention and engagement with students and community partners and shifting responses away from exclusionary discipline, um, such as in school or out of school suspensions, expulsions, punitive approaches, zero tolerance policies. And my experience with um, mental health and addictions for the past number of years says uh, that we're, we are moving away from uh, that approach. And I think it's becoming more understood and consistent, uh, uh, the kind of mental health needs that uh, exist for students. So the development and support of Schools Plus as a provincial initiative. And we recognize that uh, 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 um, Youth health centers, Schools Plus, are not always consistent across the province, um, but there is a stronger effort to start to get that into, into um, all schools. So when it comes to teaching a curriculum, you know, we can we continue to support a continued development of comprehensive health education throughout academic career, um, updated curriculum uh, addressing substance use based on interactive evidence-based materials that build on social and emotional competence, develop health literacy, looking at things like media uh, skills, uh, focusing on facts associated with substance use and why people choose to use or not use, and provide students with academic, emotional, social skills necessary to be actively engaged in school, as well as professional development for teachers and updates. Um, one of, Natalie and I were talking earlier um, about the uh, substance or drug education, substance, edu substance use education, uh, curriculum resource, question of influence. That was developed around 2010, and I think it certainly could use uh, some updated language, uh, especially when we look at some of the newer um, newer substances, so things like vaping, for example, the um, uh, legalization of cannabis over the last couple of years and edibles. Uh, but there's a lot of really good resources and materials and um, that can be updated pretty easily and get away from kind of the traditional drug education to looking at that, um, things like marketing uh, influences on youth, for example. Um, so it is a great resource that I kind of continue to direct people to. And then uh, social and physical environment. So making the school environment uh, kind of comfortable to be uh, substance use free and how do we, how do we develop that? 
and how what are the school policies that we can uh, build into that and partnerships and services so you know we re we rely on a range of partnerships um, uh, both in the school and out of school uh, to help support youth it'll be interesting in the age of covid uh, when schools go back what does that mean for some of the traditional partnerships that we've had and uh, uh, individuals and, and groups going into schools may not be happening. So how do we, you know, support that partnership development, even if they're not happening in person? Uh, and certainly this is a great example uh, in terms of being able to communicate effectively um, through other means, whether that's online or, or telephone support, all those kinds of things as well. So some of the work that we've done in health promoting schools over the last year, there's uh, a couple of documents that have uh, we've uh, forwarded. And in fact, we will make, uh, you may have received a copy of these. So the youth and vaping background document and the vaping and healthy public policy document uh, 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 were, um, shared with RCEs um, and we'll make, uh, we can make copies of those documents available um, as part of this presentation. So when we upload this presentation, we can upload some associated documents. I also think about the cannabis um, legalization document that came out from DECD uh, a year or two ago as that was ramping up as well. Um, and a recognition that intergovernmental responses are ongoing. So I am part of a, a cessation, uh, pro cessation committee with the uh, Department of Health and Wellness that's looking at uh, the issue of uh, tobacco and vaping cessation and youth and looking at some of the best practices around that and engaging um, uh, with other uh, professionals and other partners. And Navelle, I don't, you may want to touch on this as well, but we do hope to, uh, we have a policy update that is in process. So it was ready to go in the spring and then COVID hit and we pulled back rather than uh, kind of adding to the chaos of that time, but there have been some updates subsequently, including uh, changes that the Nova Scotia provincial government has made uh, to uh, some of their vaping policies. So we'll be um, putting that out, uh, hopefully in the new school school year, as well as uh, health promoting schools approach to substance use, which was a document that we were working on to, again, think about those um, bottom tiers uh, and thinking about the four pillars approach. Did I cover that novella? I feel like I covered that. Yep, that's great. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so we did have, we wanted to move into um, some discussion now just based on um, uh, everything you've heard. Um, the only thing is, uh, James, I can't, when I'm presenting my screen, I can't see the chat or the Google Meet box. So, um, or maybe Natalie, you could, um, you could help with facilitating that, that chat portion of it. But um, we just wanted to um, move into a discussion around what you're seeing as some key or emerging issues for youth, substance use and mental health in Nova Scotia. And so um, feel free to, um, you can type in the chat box or, um, Natalie, is it okay? Or if people wanted to unmute their mics, is that an option as well? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I'm learning along with everybody else. I think for sure, um, uh, for sure, if uh, someone's more comfortable typing something in the chat box, I can hold on to that question and ask it. Or if someone would like to turn off their mic and ask a question, um, the rest of us will keep our mics off while you're talking. So I'm not sure if there's anything coming up in the chat box. Sorry, um, sorry, Novella. There's no um, no questions in the chat box that I can see right now. Are there any thoughts on this question? We're happy to take questions now, but also interested to hear your thoughts as um, what you're seeing um, in your work as uh, key and emerging issues for youth right now as it relates to substance use and mental health. Or are upcoming in the fall. 
Yeah, certainly in concern, if there are concerns in, in terms of this, how September is going to look or how the fall is going to look with a lot of students returning after a long break um, and not necessarily having been engaged around uh, substance use uh, education or communication. So I'd be curious what, what others may have to say about that. Hi, I don't. I can't see everything. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Okay. I just was thinking, you know, um, with the especially junior high and even into the high school level, the kids are going to really need to show um, resilience this year. We are all creatures of habit, uh, and these kids have been in the school system for quite a few years, and they're going to want things to be as normal as possible. Um, but we might not be able to do that and they're going to have to be very resilient and some kids will adapt well and some kids won't or they'll be complaining which could put them in a negative mental health state. Mm. Uh, so I think that's very important for the teachers and parents to just help them and have them ready to adjust to what, what could be, although we really don't even know what that's going to look like. Right, yeah. I also think we need to recognize the impact of trauma uh, for a lot of you. This last uh, six months has been uh, pretty traumatic in terms of being taken away from uh, their normal routines and their normal expectations. So certainly coming back to school um, may be fraught for, for some students. So it'll be curious to see where um, uh, how students kind of react and if they're what the impact around substance use is. Um, I also question about um, do we need to prioritize substance use education? Uh, so from my background, I think it's a, it's a high priority. Uh, and certainly in the last uh, uh, number of months without having had a lot of discussion, I'd be curious how um, educators in schools are, are prepared to engage in those conversations um, or uh, what experiences uh, students may have had over the past six months. Even things like uh, prom this past uh, June, prom happened in a very different way uh, and without a lot of the parties that were associated and, and that was often a very big push when it came to mental health and addictions in terms of being able to support schools through that. So having that not happened or not uh, being aware kind of, of, of a lot of what may have happened, um, what are students experiencing? As a, as a follow-up or a consequence of that. Uh, James, I don't know, I don't, none of us have seen our students yet, right? So we're mm. not, we don't know. I personally have three teenage boys, uh, 14, 16, and 18. So I'm just looking at them and, uh, you know, two are doing great. One, I'm, you know, a bit more concerned about, I'm not substance abuse, I'm talking more mental health and just, social reasons you know in that slide how we said um you know 15 to 24 is most affected by covid uh i would you know just from again i can only speak from what's in my own house because that's all we've been that's I right agree with that uh just very socially I, you see how important the social aspect is and not to every kid just like every kid is different um but i have one kid that's more withdrawn and um it's harder even after COVID to get him out more socially even now. So I'm just, I think social is a huge, huge part of the kids' development, which is affects the mental health. Um, you know, they just get into a rut. Uh, so I think the schools have to be very aware of it. And I'm not even sure, you know, it's going to be difficult to address because we are reacting on health concerns. Yeah. Um, with regards to physical health with COVID. So it's just, you know, I say, it's just interesting for me to watch the differences in my, in my three children um, and how they're reacting and dealing with this. Because it is it is a big stress, stress for parents, but it's a stress on the teenagers as well. Thank you for that, Abigail. I appreciate that. Um, and it, 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 I agree with you in terms of 
uh, the, the sociability. I noticed uh, Michelle Day in the comments uh, section uh, mentioned the lack of movement within the building. So even uh, for students who may not have been interacting with their friends, if their friends aren't part of their classroom bubble, um, then how is that going to impact their social development and engagement? Um, so there are there are lots of unknowns right now in terms of how this is going to unfold, right? Yes, I agree completely. Did you want to move to the next discussion question, James? Um, I'm going to throw it back to Natalie. I just wonder in terms of some of the chat, you had mentioned the, the teen mental health uh, with Dr. Kucher. Uh, did you want to mention, did you want to talk about that at all, Natalie? Yeah, I guess I would just say that, um, I guess I would just say that, um, is that for those of you who uh, may have not been teaching health education or healthy living, um, or even for those of you who might be in lower grade levels, Dr. Stan Kucher, who's uh, now Senator, um, was, uh, led the work and, and the development of team mental health, which was, um, which he was chair of and which took place um, which was a Nova Scotia kind of grassroots um, mental health resource for um, youth. Now, when um, when Stan became uh, a senator, um, that work um, needed to finish here, and as such, Alberta Health Services has um, taken it over. Nonetheless, the website and all the resources on it at teammentalhealth.org are really useful, and I think I think it's probably. Um, I know that they have done some pieces related to uh, the time of COVID, and it may be really useful um, as, a, as a teacher and an educator, staff member in a school administration to have a look at um, the resources because one of the, um, one of the important components, one of the four components of mental health literacy is around that coping um, and self-management and resilience. And I think spending time um, in discussion with youth around um, healthy ways of coping is going to be um, to be um, really important, and to really um, um, there's other really great pieces in there around the role of stress and anxiety, so that we don't want to pathologize stress and anxiety. We want it. We want to um, reiterate that stress and anxiety has a role for humans. Um, in that it, it's a data source that tells us that we need to adapt and change to our environment. And of course, we are doing that in spades here during COVID, whether you are a young person um, or anywhere on the, you know, on the age um, spectrum. But I, I really recommend that resource as, um, as a go-to um, also early on in the school year. Um, and I think, uh, James, you're probably reading some things. Um, in the school environment. And I think it, it says, you know, um, you know, we, we have concerns if, if our, particularly our P to 8 students are working in um, cohorts, um, that they won't feel as connected to the school environment. But I think we do have an opportunity to feel very connected within um, the cohorts that um, students will be moving in, whatever that will look like. Um, and I think that could be, um, uh, juxtaposed with being at home and, and um, not having an in-person cohort, that can be very strong um, as well. And I think it's really probably going to be very important to up play is not the word I'm looking for, but up play the fact that we're, we're going to be able to have very, very um, close and safe relationships with those cohorts that we're in and the teachers that um, we're all very, for that our kids will be very fortunate to be with. Great, thank you, Natalie. Um, let's move to the second question. We had a second question, um, and we'll we'll see. Um, for those of you like thinking about um, this health impact pyramid that we we had shown up before, um, and just things like uh, you know the, the four pillars approach that we talked about. So. Um, uh, school policy, partnerships and services, curriculum and learning. Um, and and moving to that lower level of the pyramid, so changing the, the school context, some of those things are happening um, already, and certainly uh, in terms of the back to school approach, uh, what's that going to mean for students? And we've talked a little bit about that. We're just thinking beyond the classroom and curriculum, what role can schools play in terms of reducing the harms of substance use and promoting positive mental health? So I'm curious if you've 
if given any thought to that or have any any um any comments you'd like to make Uh, so Michelle mentions normalizing gender identity discussions. Nice. So that's uh, not nice, but um, in terms of thinking about, you know, th this discussion is focused on substance use, but certainly what are the impacts around um, uh, how choose how students may choose to utilize or not utilize substance um, brings up a whole raft of um, uh, a number of personal issues for youth, uh, including things like gender identity and sexuality, uh, certainly can have a big impact as well. Um, so being able to normalize some of those discussions, um, certainly we know that um, when students feel that uh, they have an individual in the school that they feel safe to confide in, um, that's often a, a, a very strong protective factor uh, for students. I was, um, when I worked with mental health and addictions, uh, I was a health promoter and often in schools uh, doing youth programming um, at the time in, in those years. And uh, I was often quite resistant to becoming the go-to individual in the school. Uh, it, so if somebody had, a, um, were struggling with their substances or substance use, um, uh, often the uh, teachers may want to ask me to kind of help out with that. And my work really focused on educating um, teachers and resource personnel who were within the school to feel comfortable about having discussions around substance use um, so that it didn't become kind of an external partner uh, who was having those conversations, but rather that anybody could begin to have those conversations so that uh, students were feeling comfortable in terms of uh, engaging around sensitive topics and sensitive discussions. So um, I think that will continue to be a thrust and I go back to Michelle's point, but being able to be comfortable in terms of normalizing a lot of really tough conversations um, has a lot of positive impacts, including uh, those in terms of uh, substance use and, and, and substance misuse. Any other comments people might have? I want to be conscious of time and we have a couple of other slides. Okay, Novella, do you want to just talk about some of the select services that we we kind of came up with on our own? Sure. So just to, just really quickly, here are some of the the services and resources available for youth. So of course, uh, you know the youth health centers and schools plus, if um, available in your region. Uh, also, the NSHA mental health crisis line. Um, there's a few other um, as well as the IWK um, intake and navigation line. Um, of course, Kids Help Phone, IWK also has um, a website that has a plethora of um, really valuable websites for children and youth. Um, there's also now um, a provincial service that provides 24 seven texting support for children and youth. Um, as well, there's those two, um, not listed here, but there's those two resources that James and Natalie mentioned previously. So I think um, Team Mental Health uh, was the website Madly mentioned, as well as the Question of Influence resource that James talked about. Um, and then finally, just um, we would just recommend if, uh, if you're looking for information online, we would really highly recommend um, these three sites is kind of like a you know a vetted source of health information. So Canadian Center for Substance Use and Addiction, the Canadian Mental Health Association, and the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Those are kind of your three best bets for um, trusted health information. And just our last slide, uh, just some additional resources. And I just wanted to post. So you may. I, 
mental health and addictions has been providing a lot of uh, good information on their uh, social media feeds. So, you know, that's just an example of, of one of their social media postings. Uh, we are here to help that gives a number of different resources that's available through mental health and addictions. Um, and I, I wanted to give a shout out to the health promoting schools websites that are across the province as well. So uh, healthy school communities with AVRCE, the Blossom website with uh, Cape Breton Victoria Regional Center for Education and uh, the healthy HRC, uh, HRCE Healthy School Communities uh, on their website. And then there's a national site as well if you're really interested in health promoting schools and the joint consortium. Um, so there's a joint consortium on school health, which is a national body um, that has just had a new mandate renewal. And they are often focused on uh, upstream items. There's a lot of work that they're working on around uh, youth vaping, for example. Uh, so they have uh, additional resources as well that are available to the public.